First Thessalonians. So a couple things. I was praying and, and, and left church Sunday, and the Lord's talking to me. And I'm not going to teach on the fear of the Lord today, part two, but I am going to say a few things about it. And what the Lord spoke to me is, Brad, people don't understand that. A lot of, they just don't understand the fear of the Lord, how good the fear of the Lord is. And I'm just going to tap on it a little bit, maybe later when I go in there. But you have to know, uh, as we taught last week, that the fear of the Lord is good. In fact, let me just tap on it for a second now. How, how about that? Flip over to Isaiah. Put your finger in Thessalonians. Flip over to Isaiah 11. And the reason I'm taking time for this, I know the Holy Spirit said, Brad, they don't understand that. It even actually offends some people, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is beautiful, it's clean, we all need it, it's powerful. Jesus had it, David had it, Paul had it, they all had it, they had to the fear of the Lord, it's a good thing. Let me read this, I'm going to read a list of things out of Isaiah 11. It says, then a shoot will grow up from a stump of Jesse, a branch and his roots will bear fruit. Now, who is that shoot? Who is that branch? Don't someone tell me? Jesus. He's from the seed of David. You can find that in Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus came from the seed of David, and he is the king. He's the future king. And listen to how the prophet describes Jesus. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. How many want the spirit of the Lord to rest on him? Who can you think of in the Bible that had the Spirit of the Lord on them? Some powerful people, but I, this one guy I think of, I'll give you a clue. He killed, uh, what, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. I'm not in trouble for cussing, right? King James there. Samson, the Spirit, the spirit of the Lord came on him, and he killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. All right, it says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, or what Ken read this morning, you could say a spirit of wisdom and revelation. How many would like to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation? Do you know, I pray for it every day. I pray for it. God, give me the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Give me the spirit of uh, wisdom and revelation. I should say I desire to. I, most days I pray that prayer for myself. I actually pray it for the congregation too. It's not going to do me any good to have revelation and wisdom if you guys don't get it too, right? We all need the Spirit. Well, Jesus had the Spirit of the Lord. He also had the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's three. Number four, the Spirit of counsel will be on him. How many want counsel? You need to make a decision. and you need... How many need to make a decision today? You've got something that's looming in your life. Okay, the Spirit of counsel is on you right now. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel is on you right now. God is giving you counsel, and it comes as a gift through Jesus. Did you know that? Colossians 2, 3 says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him. Isn't that powerful? You've got it. Say, I've got it. I've got Jesus. I've got the whole package. I've got this. This is good stuff. In fact, you could call it good news. You could call it good news. A spirit of counsel, a spirit of strength. Who needs to be strong? I need to be strong. A spirit of knowledge. The Word of God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Who wants the spirit of knowledge? Man, you guys at work should be the smartest people at work. Did you know that? You should be. You should have answers. Your boss has questions. You should walk in and have the answer for your boss. Well, Brother Brad, I'm not that smart. No one said you were that smart. In fact, we know you're not that smart. Look at your neighbor and said, we know you're not that smart. Jace wouldn't do it. You did, though, right? Amen. But you know who is that smart? The Lord. The Lord gave Joseph a dream. He went into his boss, and Joseph got promoted, got thrown into prison, had another dream, went into his boss, got promoted again. Daniel had a dream. Everybody was going to be killed. All the wise men were going to be killed there in Babylon or Persia, wherever it was, and he had a dream, and he went in and saved his life and their life, and the king honored him and elevated him to number four in power. That same spirit is on you, and I wish you'd believe it. Someone say, I believe it. You should be blessing your boss with wisdom because the spirit of wisdom is on you. You don't earn it. You don't find it in boxes of breeze. You get it from the Lord. It's a gift. Isn't that amazing? 
It's amazing. God gives you wisdom. The Bible says if you ask for wisdom, and what does it say? He'll give it to you and he won't even criticize you. He's not going to find fault with you. He's not going to criticize. In fact, the Word of God begs you, urges you, pleads with you constantly, ask me for wisdom. I will pour out my spirit on you. How many want a spirit of knowledge? How many want a spirit of wisdom? How many want a spirit of understanding? Aren't those all good things? Listen to this last one. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now, if those six are good, that last one must be good. It's through the fear of the Lord that we run from evil. We eschew evil. The Spirit of the Lord has saved my bacon more than once. Because I was going to do something wrong, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, oh, no. Remember last week I talked about getting those weapons? I said, Lord, I don't want a weapon. I'm just going to stop that right here. I got the spirit of the fear of the Lord. But it's even more than there. The Bible says there's something pure and something clean about it. It's not being scared of God. God is love. We approach God. The spirit of the fear of the Lord gives us an awe and a respect that it draws us to God, not away from Him. It's scared that draws you away from God when you're afraid of God because you're sinning and you're doing what you shouldn't do and you're like Adam in the garden. The spirit of the fear of the Lord draws you to God. You draw close to Him. you got to know that. The Lord told me that some of you still didn't understand that. So there you have it. And there's good reason to have the fear of the Lord. There's many good reasons. And I was studying this week, and the Lord surprised me uh, out of Hebrews, and I'm not going to go there because I want to save time, but in the book of he- Hebrews chapter 6, and I may preach it later, the whole section there, Paul talked about some basic doctrines, and I believe the Holy Spirit was telling me, Brad, the one reason the church has lost some of this fear of the Lord is some of these basic doctrines like eternal judgment. It is a basic doctrine of the church that there is eternal judgment. That You know that, right? Every person that's born, every single person, Christian, non-Christian, will stand before God and answer for their life. Paul calls it the doctrine of eternal judgment. He mentions it, and I talked about it last week. Even Christians will answer for their lives. But even in a positive context, I think sometimes... The reason that we, I could run down the aisle here, the reason that we don't share Christ more with people is we don't understand that people are in jeopardy of spending eternity away from God. And when we don't really believe that, or we don't really believe in eternal judgment, well, you know, who cares, right? You know, they'll figure it out, right? They're going to figure it out. Even some... Maybe they don't even pray for their children because they, yeah, you know, God's, God's a good God and God is love and He is love and He is a good God and there's no real concern. I think in the church overall, in many places, this doctrine of eternal judgment is not taught. And if the doctrine of eternal judgment is not taught, there will be no fear of the Lord. There was a man, a great Christian man, He had a major ministry. If I said his name, you would know it. And there was a brother that talked to him, and he fell. He committed adultery, and he became money hungry. He started being hungry for money, and he lived for money. And he's cheated on his wife, and he started living in luxury. And the pastor asked him, he said, uh, the guy rehabilitated. He gave his life back to God. I believe he's serving God today. And he said, when did you stop loving God? And he said, I never stop loving God. He goes, wait a minute, time out. You cheated on your wife. You, you know, you did, you, you said, and he said, surely you, because I never stopped loving God. I always loved God. He said, but pastor, I did not have any fear of God. He said, I had no fear of God. I had no fear of consequences in my life. And I fell, fell horribly. And when he was judged, and he was judged, and he was in prison, the Lord came to him. What a great God we have. What a merciful, loving God we have. He came to him, and he brought him back 
to salvation. Sometimes it's the judgment of God that will bring you back to God. In my life, I know there was a time in my mid-40s that judgment came into my life. And I was reduced to tears and, and I just my life was a wreck and judgment came. But in the middle of that judgment on my life, we could argue it's the devil, it's God. I'm not going to argue that today. It brought me to repentance. And I thank God that I had to experience what I experienced because it put me on my knees. And it made me realize if I keep living the way I'm living, my life will be just absolutely destroyed. And I gave my life back to God. And I've been running and serving and loving God since then. My sins are forgiven. My sins were washed away. My night was turned to day. Uh, happy am I. You know, I could sing all those songs. Happy am I. My sins were washed away. My night, and I love Jesus. And I have a reverential fear. I'm not scared of Jesus, but I have a respect and awe of God that I know that the Lord doesn't count in sin. If Jesus died for your sins, he did it for a good reason. Rich Mullins had a song. How many of you know that I used to live with Rich Mullins? You guys know Rich? He was my roommate in Cincinnati. I lived with Rich Mullins. And he had this song. He said, it wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, it wasn't for nothing that the Lord spilled his blood. You can look in the Bible, in this eternal judgment, Noah was spared and the whole world was destroyed in the days of Noah. There was judgment on the earth, wasn't there? The whole earth, but God favored Noah. He was righteous in God's eyes. And anybody that's righteous in God's eyes, it's by faith, I promise you. It's justification by faith. And we see if you go from Genesis all the way to Revelation, God never changes. And one aspect of God is he never changes. In fact, in the book of Revelation, there's a, 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 a lid that the revelator, I think an angel, lifted up. And all these people are crying out, saying, how long, Lord, will it be until we're avenged? Our blood is avenged. They were murdered for the gospel. They were murdered for Jesus' sake and are saying, Lord, when will our blood be avenged? And he said, in a short time. It'll happen. Do you know why God doesn't just come and bring instant judgment on you and on people? And He loves you. And he's patient. And he's long-suffering. And the word of God says God doesn't want one soul to perish. Not one. Nobody. But it's a serious thing. If we really believe the Bible, and we really believe that Jesus had to spill his blood, this is God's son. You can imagine if you had a son, or, and you are going to offer your son or your daughter for someone else's deliverance and salvation, you can imagine the seriousness of the offense that must have happened in order to require the blood of your child. And then even the love of the father to offer his son. And this is the language of the Bible. It's a serious thing. We've been studying evangelism and discipleship. And that's, I, it's also to me a reason why we don't take it more seriously. And I'm not going to pick on you today. I'm going to pick on Brad. That's why I don't take it more seriously. You say, I'm not good at sharing. Are you good at crying and praying for people? Are you good at going on your knees and crying to God and saying, God, be merciful to my son. Be merciful to my daughter. Lord, be merciful to my neighbor. Are you good at praying then? You're not good at talking. Do we really believe in the doctrine? You say, Brother Brad, tell us something good. I'm going to tell you something good. This is good news for us. But the gospel is not good news for those that are perishing. Brother Brad, why are you talking about evangelism and discipleship? Because I promise you, this is what Jesus is thinking about. I promise you, he's thinking about people that are lost and perishing. I promise you, he doesn't want your children, your grandchildren, your aunts, your uncles, your neighbors to spend eternity separated from God. I promise you, he doesn't. And he's looking to us. 
And he's saying, I'll give you the spirit of might. I'll give you the spirit of power. I'll give you the ability if you just say, hey, I'll I'll do it, Lord. I don't know how many times I said, God, help me. I, I am incapable of doing what you want me to do. Lord, help me. And he does. So the Lord had me in the book of Thessalonians. And I, I want to show you this, this dichotomy. The Bible says, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. You, you guys know that scripture in the book of Romans. He says, goodness on us that believe, but severity on those that disobey God. The Bible just doesn't say it's all happy days. In fact, do you guys remember, and I'm not a, I'm not a basher. I don't like bashing people. I don't really want to mention names, but I, I got the book up here. Do you remember this book that came out called Love Wins? Anybody remember that? Love Wins. And really, if you read the book and study it, he's really removing the doctrine of eternal judgment away, or at least certainly the doctrine of hell, that there's going to be eternal consequences. And honestly, books like that are written, I think it's hard for people sometimes to reconcile the fact that God is love, but God is also judge, isn't he? How can you read the Bible and not see that? It's almost like we have on a Pollyanna glasses or something, and we're just looking at everything Pollyanna, like I like to use the expression, like all dogs go to heaven, you know? We just have that Pollyanna, but that's not what the Bible says. In fact, uh, Frank, Francis Chan wrote a book replying to that book, and he wrote a book called Erasing Hell, and he answered that book, and he did it scripturally. What does the Bible really say about eternal judgment? You say, Brother Brad, why is this important? Because there's eternal consequences at stake for your children. I've told the Lord all the time, I say, God, it wouldn't be heaven without my boy. How could it be? Now, the word says, God will wipe away every tear from our eye. It says that, and I believe he will. So as I was going through the book of Thessalonians, and here's where I'm going, it, can, can, it, can it really be 10 till 12? No, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. It's not your fault. In fact, I, Ken, I was going to preach on authority. That's a very, I'm, Matthew 8 was where Brad Kittle wanted to go. But the Lord keeps telling me, we've got to get our hearts with his heart, which is loving people, caring about people. What good's authority if you don't love people? Mm-hmm. What good's power if you don't love somebody? Amen. What good is it? What if I gave all my money to the poor, but I didn't love you? What good's that? What if I gave my body to be burned, but I didn't care about you? What good's that? The good news is God is love, and I want to show you this in Thessalonians. That's why I wanted to go through it. There are so many scriptures right away you really do see the heart of God. And there's so many questions you could ask me, I know, and I won't have time to answer every question. I'll sit down with anybody over coffee and discuss theology and the Bible. You just want to talk to me, I'll talk to you. But right away, in the book of Thessalonians, we come out and Paul sets the tempo that God is a God of love. And even Paul himself, he says that I am praying, in verse 2 of Thessalonians chapter 1, he says, I thank God for all of you. I make mention of you constantly before God in my prayers. So Paul is a man that is constant. If you read the book of Philippians, and then you read the book of Thessalonians, Paul is a man of God. And he is praying constantly for people. Read Thessalonians, read Philippians, I'm praying for you all the time. And what type of prayers is he praying? I'm praying that you're encouraged. I'm praying that you're blessed. I'm praying that God empowers you. I'm praying that you have endurance. I'm praying that Satan doesn't tempt you and trick you and deceive you and knock you off the path. He goes on in verse 4, he says, For we know, brothers and sisters, who are loved by God. God, that he has chosen you. I want you to catch that. Because I want to anchor this eternal judgment, eternal salvation. He says, you are loved 
by God. Everyone in this room, you talk about these things. We shouldn't be scared of God. We are loved by God. And in fact, it says not only are you loved by God, but you've been chosen by God. Now, we could get into predestination and all, but that would take us down a long path that nobody wants to go on. We'd be here until at least 1230. Someone say, don't go there, Brad. Don't go there, Brad. Thank you, Sister Kittle. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Kittle. I want to anchor this in the fact that God loves you. If you went on in verse 8, and Paul says in verse 8, he says that he cared for them and he cared about their faith. I, I, I can't, I could stop and read them all. I, I'll just tap on this. Paul longed to see them. Paul called these people his glory and his crown. He called them his reward. You're my reward. You're my glory. You're my crown. It sounds like Paul loved them, doesn't it? But what's amazing is Paul continuously, and it, when you go into 2 Thessalonians, it's the same theme. In 2 Thessalonians, he says that you are loved by God. Do you believe that you're loved by God? We are loved by God. And this love was beautifully reflected in Paul's life where he didn't count his life dear to himself. He didn't care if he lost his life. He said, I'm doing everything and laying down my life for the gospel because I've judged that if one man died for all, then all men are dead. And that all that died should henceforth live not unto themselves, but unto him that died for them. That was Paul's passion and his desire. But Paul also said, knowing the terror or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. It's my duty. How many of you know the story of Ezekiel? What, what, what God told the prophet Ezekiel. Anybody know that story? This is Bible 101. God said, hey, Ezekiel, I'm giving you a message. And he says, listen, you need to tell sinners, you need to tell wicked people that if the wicked man sins, he is going to die. And he said, if you tell them, their blood is no longer on your hands. He says, but if you don't tell them that they're going to die, he said, I'm going to put that blood at your hands. How many knew that's in there? Now, I don't, I'm not putting that on the church. There's no condemnation in Christ. I'm just telling you that's how serious it is. He said, however, if you warn the wicked man and he doesn't repent, that's on him. Now, we're in a little different covenant. We live in an absolute covenant of grace. It's good news. Our message to anybody that's wicked, to the wicked man, is Jesus loves you and he died for you. And not one sin you ever committed has to be laid to your charge. We took communion today. And we, in our communion, that blood of Jesus that we drank, the testimony of the blood of Jesus is not one of your sins need be ever brought before God. That's the gospel of God's grace, isn't it? Amen. Are you guys with me? Yes. I, I want to, <laughs> I don't have time. I want to drive this home that God is love and he loves us profoundly. Jesus wept over people. The Bible says, even now, Jesus is a high priest, and he's making intercession for us. He's praying for us right now. If you don't know Jesus and you're in this room, Jesus is praying for you right now. But right in this same context, this context of great love and great sacrifice, Paul makes this statement. He says, and this is verse 8 of chapter, or verse 9 of chapter 1. He says, they themselves report what kind of reception we had and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Isn't that something? They repented. Mm -hmm. They turned from serving idols and now they're serving the living and true God. And he says, we are waiting for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Ken. Jesus was raised from the dead. 
Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Do you see that? Do you see it? Do you really see it? Now, if you believe the gospel and you believe the Bible, it's in there all the time. The coming wrath. Noah teaches us that God judges the world. Sodom and Gomorrah teaches us that God will judge the world. The book of Revelations, the, the gospel of God's grace, which is in Romans, the word wrath is in there all the time. We receive grace. We receive the gospel. We re by faith, we, our sins are forgiven. We receive the love of God. But for those that do not, they resist the gospel. They resist the truth. They insist on sin and embracing a sinful lifestyle. They will be judged over Jesus' dead body and risen body. Honestly, we should be shouting because... Paul says, he talks about, I'm, I get it, regarding wrath. Chapter 5, Thessalonians, he says, But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of hope and salvation. Get this, for God did not appoint us to wrath. That's good news. Isn't that good news? Now, if you don't think that people are appointed to judgment, e eternal judgment, then I guess, well, you know, I don't know what you think. All dogs go to heaven. I, I don't know what you think. But that is not what the Bible teaches. And this is what should give me, I don't talk about you, should give me a sense of urgency about this message, at least in prayer, when I go to pray for people praying for them. We're not appointed to wrath. The day that God, by His grace, illuminated our hearts and we realized that Jesus died for our sins and we repented, like they did in Thessalonica, they repented and they turned from idols. They turned from their... That's one of the doctrines of uh, the church is repentance. They turned away from their sin and they let go of their idols and they embraced Jesus. And then God's mercy and love. And in fact, I do believe, you know, this doctrine of once saved, always saved. You know, people argue about that. And again, I don't want to open that can of worms up. But I do know this. I believe there is not one person in this world that wants to be saved that won't be saved. I believe you have to hand it back to God. You have to reject it. That's how merciful God is. You have to reject it. Let me read another scripture. Are you guys with me? Yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I know it's a serious message, but for you, it's grace. For you, you've escaped the wrath to come. In fact, what we should be, because we've escaped the wrath to come, we should be ambassadors with good news. Like, hey, I, I want to ask you honestly, how many of you, when you weren't serving God and weren't following God, you walked around feeling guilty and you knew that something was wrong between you and God. You knew. I did. I did. I kept sinning anyway because I was a good sinner. I loved to sin. I embraced sin like the best of sinners. I loved it. I enjoyed it until I didn't anymore. Until my sin became too much of a burden for me to bear. You mentioned God, I'm going the other way. Right? But in my darkness... God broke through that in His grace, illuminated Jesus to me, and I got saved. And, I, and now, it's like the things that I used to do, I don't want to do them anymore. This God that I was scared of, I'm no longer scared of. I fear Him, I honor Him, respect, but I love Him. I see He's beautiful. And I see everything before my life was just a deception. It was a piece of fruit. It was a an apple on a tree or a piece of fruit being offered to me in place of the truth. He still offers that fruit to us. Let me read this, and then I'm going to finish the message. First, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. You guys still with me? 
Okay, it's a clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you will be counted worthy of God's kingdom, for which you also are suffering, since it is just for God to repay those with affliction who are afflicting you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. This will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with His powerful angels, when He takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and those who don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from His glorious strength. Do you want anybody to be locked out of God's presence? I don't. And God doesn't either. And God has paid the price. We're into evangelism. We're into discipleship. We're saved. Our name's in the book. The blood of Jesus has guaranteed it. We love Jesus. But our neighbor, the one that doesn't know the Lord, he needs to know. They called Noah a preacher of righteousness. Do you know why they called Noah a preacher of righteousness? Have you ever thought about that? Noah was warning people. How long was it? Jeff, do you know how long it was that Noah was preaching to these people? It was a while. 120 years, and I'm closing. Noah was preaching 100, 120 years, and he was telling people, hey, there's a flood coming. I am sure that they thought Noah was crazy. Does anybody think you're crazy? Sometimes. All the time. That's because people, till your eyes are open, like poof. Yeah, I am a sinner. Yeah, I do need Jesus. You're right. Noah was preaching for over 100 years and warning these people that judgment was coming. And judgment did come. And they called, the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. It's our responsibility of believers. And I can say, if you're not a good speaker, then you can pray. You can pray. You can ask God to help you. Whenever, whenever he can, you can ask God to help you. But it's our responsibility. How many believe this is the last days? Anybody believe that? I know a lot of people tell me they do. Then we should live like it, right? Shouldn't we? I'm not fighting with people. I'm not going into the world to fight with people on politics. I'm just not. I'm a very conservative person politically. I've said it a thousand times. I am not going into the world to argue with people. I am going into the world to put my hand out and saying, Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. If you will turn, Jesus will save you. If you'll change, if you'll repent and turn from your life, Jesus will save you. Brother Brad, I've messed up. I know God loves you. Don't worry about your sin. Jesus loves you. Fellow Christian, Brad, I've messed up. Jesus loves you. He's calling you home. He's calling you in. Jesus loves you. That's what I'm interested in. If we really believe the word of God, that's it. And we have this good news. And we have this treasure. We have a God that's so worthy of awe and respect and love, right? We should should be sharing him, shouldn't we? I want every eye closed, every head bowed. It would be a sin for me not to do this. If you're here today... You say, Brother Brad, you just think that's true.